Hello everyone, my name is Jitsia Kivanya Supersad. I have a degree in a Bachelor of Social Science in Geography and Environmental Management. My topic is Human Population. On our hierarchy of models, we've been through the physical, chemical and biological aspects to understand how the Earth was created. We now move on to the last stage and that is the human aspect. Here is where we understand the social, political and economic factors. So to recap from our previous talk on climate change, we've learned that the biggest contributors to climate change are in fact humans. The climate change in Africa is constantly changing and there is a need for mitigation and adaptation. So just a brief outline to ensure that we are on the same page. We will be discussing what is human population and how the populations have changed over the past few centuries. And to understand this, we need to look at the statistics involved as well as the factors that affected the human population during this period of time. It is also during this time in which we will see how the population has had an effect on the environment and vice versa. Then we will narrow down our talk into understanding why is it here in South Africa our population is so special. So, what is human population? It is the number of people living in a particular area. As we've learned from human evolution, we've understood that humans have migrated out of Africa and moved to different continents, leading to our global population. So, how do we study human population? Well, we have what is called demography. Demography is the statistical study of human populations, which involves the study of size, structure, and distribution of these populations, as well as temporal and spatial changes in response to birth, death, aging, and migration. It also helps us to understand the nature in which populations change over time. So to further understand demography, we have the history of the world's population graph. This is a graph that represents the population from the old stone age to modern day times. As you can see on our y-axis, we have population in billions and years on our x-axis. Before the agricultural revolution, the population growth was consistent. As we move past the agricultural revolution, we start to see a gradual increase in the human population. However, there had been a significant drop in the population and this is as a result of the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death. This was an epidemic that hit the world and killed billions of people. It was a bacterial disease that was carried by rodents, which then in turn affected humans. It was later then that Thomas Malthus put It was later then that Thomas Malthus put forward his hypothesis that stated human population would grow exponentially while agricultural production would grow linearly. Eventually the human population would exceed the agricultural production, resulting in a population crash. However, this was proven wrong in the 1800s, which saw the Industrial Revolution. This was a significant turning point in the world's history as we saw an introduction to medical facilities and economic growth. We see a continuation in the growth of the population which is indicated in the J-shape of our graph. This is further explained by Esther Busrup who put forward her hypothesis stating that the human population will grow in conjunction to its agricultural production. As long as there is pressure on our natural resources, there will be a need for technological advancements to improve agricultural production in order to sustain the population. 
So now we need to understand how the population is distributed on a global scale. And for this, we have our world population distribution graph. On our y-axis, we have billions of people. And our x-axis, we have years. As you can see, we have exponential growth in our less developed regions in comparison to our more developed regions. And the factors affecting this is that less developed regions have slow economic growth, limited access to medical facilities, and lack of education. So now we understand some of the statistics from prehistoric times to now. In the 1950s, we were around 3 billion people, and by 2040, we are estimated to be 9 billion people. Isn't it amazing how long we've managed to survive? But at what cost? So to understand the factors that affect human populations, we have what is called the demographic transition model. The demographic transition model refers to the transition from an increase in birth and death rates to a decrease in birth and death rates as a country or region shifts from a pre-industrial to an industrialized economic system. This is our demographic transition model. Associated with this are four stages, that is your pre-industrial, transitional, industrial and post-industrial. In our pre-industrial, you see the birth and death rates at a consistent rate. However, they remain high. This was a period of time where we saw little to no services at all and a period of war, drought and diseases. As we move on into our transitional stage, we see a significant drop in the death rate. However, the birth rate remains high as a means to compensate for the death rates. This was a period which saw the introduction to medical facilities, proper sanitation and agricultural production. We then move on to our industrialized stage in which we see a significant drop in the birth rate as well. This was a period which saw the introduction to education, family planning, women with an economic status, improvement in technology, and rapid economic growth. We then move on to our industrialized stage, which is the final stage. Here we see that the population is finally stable and is a time where there is easy access to goods and services. Economic growth is rapid and there are many advancements in technology and in medical facilities. So we go back and understand the views associated with the demographic transition model. We have the optimistic, pessimistic, and social justice view. The optimistic view states that the population will stabilize sometime this century. The pessimistic view states that helping the less developed regions only poses a threat to our natural resources. And lastly, the social justice view isn't so much about a lack of resources, but it is a lack of justice. So, how do we understand how our life expectancies are affected by these? We have what is called our population pyramids. I use the example of the United States and South Africa. The United States has a more tower shape and its highest life expectancy is that of 75 to 79 whereas South Africa is more of a pyramid shape with a wider base and its highest life expectancy is that of 60 to 64. And the factors that affect this is the GDP per capita, 
access to medical facilities for the entire population, education, and while the United States is a developed country, whereas South Africa is an emerging economy. And although this is true, it is also important to note that there is still a large poverty gap that exists in South Africa. To look at the life expectancy on a global scale, we have our world life expectancy map, with the highest life expectancy being 80 in red and your lowest being blue and 40. As you can see, developed regions like North America, part of South America, Europe and Australia have a high life expectancy in comparison to Africa, which has the highest life expectancy of that of 55 and 60. So what happens when there are too many people in one place? Well, we have what is called overpopulation. This is the number of existing humans which exceeds the carrying capacity of the Earth. What does this mean? No, it doesn't mean you're going to fall off the Earth. But it does spell danger for our environment as well as our natural resources used to sustain ourselves. So what are the causes and effects of overpopulation? While your causes are decline in death rate, improved health care and increased food supply. And the effects of this is a depletion of natural resources environmental degradation, conflicts and war, and overcrowding. So, how do we solve overpopulation? Well, for starters, we need to empower women and educate them. By doing this, we allow them to be part of the working class. And here, we need to also allow access to family planning for both men and women. And in turn, they will make better decisions with starting their families. And lastly, the possibility of implementing the one-child policy. So, what is the one-child policy? Well, this was a policy of Communist China, which was implemented between 1979-2015. The benefits of this was that the population growth was stemmed, and the GDP dramatically increased. However, the cons were that human rights were violated, in that there were forced abortions, and that female infanticide was common. Female infanticide is the deliberate killing of female babies. So the question stands, could or should we apply it? the one-child policy in South Africa. We now move on to understanding how the GDP of a country affects the population. We look at the optimum theory of population which was created by Edwin Cannon in the 1924s which states that the population size will affect a country's GDP. This means that the optimum population will equate to the maximum economic welfare on our graph, per capita income on the y-axis and population on the x-axis, we see that when a country or region is underpopulated, the economic welfare is minimum. Once it reaches a state of optimization, there is maximum economic welfare. However, once the population increases and there is overpopulation, the GDP will decrease again. So, when a population is high, how is this affected by its GDP? Well, we have two cities in the same province, part of Soweto and Santon. As you can see in Soweto, there are shanty houses, it is claustrophobic and there is poor sanitation, whereas Santon has excellent infrastructure good sanitation, and easy access to goods and services. To further show how it has an effect on populations, we look at the diets and the size of their families. We take the examples of the USA, 
Germany, Ecuador, and Sudan, all ranging from a high GDP to a low GDP, respectively. The USA has a variation in diet, well, not so much of a variation as the food is mostly unhealthy, but they do have a small family. Whereas Germany has a variation in their diet as well, which is more healthy, and they have a small family. We then move on to Ecuador, which has a slightly larger family. However, there is a smaller variation in their diet. And lastly, we move on to Sudan, which also has a large family, but a very limited variation in their diet. Now that we've understood all of this, how does a population affect the environment? The most important aspect. It's amazing to say that humans are able to mass produce goods and services in order to sustain our needs. But this comes with a price. And that price is water, air, and land pollution. If these areas are not rehabilitated or even taken care of, we are left with barren and polluted lands. And the end result of this is disease and the destruction of biodiversity. So the question stands, is population growth the most concerning factor in environmental degradation? That's something for you to think about. To make it happier now, we move on to special South Africa. Why is our country so special? To start off with, we have a variation in our population density. I take the example of Gauteng and the Northern Cape. The Northern Cape has a large area but fewer people and Gauteng is a smaller province with a large amount of people. So what are the factors that affect these? Well, for one, transportation, access to goods and services, standards of living, and economic growth. We all know that Gauteng is the city of gold. To further explain why South Africa is special, we are a diverse country with various ethnicities and 11 official languages. I myself am a perfect example. I'm an Indian. My name is part Arabic and I'm part Korean. That's something for you to think about as well. So to further show why South Africa is special, I use an example of South Africa and compare it to my home, that is South Korea. Our population size is 56.72 million, where South Korea is 51.47 million. We have 11 official languages, where South Korea just has one. So to conclude my talk, we have understood that demography is the study of human populations. The human population will continue to grow. And there is a question of will the expansion of the human population equate to bad news for the environment? And if so, what is the way forward? Do we look for alternative measures to control the population? Or do we find a way to continue producing goods and services in a sustainable manner to allow our future generations to enjoy what we have now. We will understand this further in our next talk.